production of Kansas City Week in Review is made possible through the generous support of Dave and Jamie Cummings, Smithfield Foods, Haas and Wilkerson Insurance, and by viewers like you. Thank you. Hello, I'm Nick Haynes. This week we're on location, lifting up the hood on our libraries. With one excessive heat warning after another this summer, area libraries have become a sanctuary for people without air conditioning. Our libraries are increasingly filling other voids. This half hour, we bring together the Metro's four top library directors as we dissect the role, challenges, and future of our libraries. Crosby Kemper leads the Kansas City Public Library System. Sean Cassily is the Johnson County Library Director. Carol Levers is Chief Librarian in Kansas City, Kansas. And Steve Potter heads the Mid-Continent Public Library System. Over the last six months, KCPT's digital magazine Flatland has been nosing between the book stacks to chronicle the shifting work of our libraries in a film series we call Libraries Out Loud. Life is now caught in a tangle of smartphones and tweets, Facebook, texts, apps, and tablets. We upload our movies to clouds. Our city is ablaze with Google Fiber. The buzz is getting louder. And things like books and the reading of literature are being put to one side. Spare a thought then, just one, for our libraries, our humble public libraries. Serene, safe, and quiet. Shelves of printed ink. How quaint. We reveal how the libraries are adapting to our new light-footed age. We had amazing databases with all this great information, but no one was using it. How they're connecting people, educating people, how they're helping business people. This is our flea market area. How they're bridging the digital divide, and yes, how they still lend so, precious books. This is like Christmas. The library is extremely important to me, and I consider it one of my best friends. At a, time, at a time today when you can download a book in a matter of minutes, you can look up a fact, a very intricate fact on Google and get an instantaneous result. Why do we need libraries and who is the audience for libraries today, Steve Potter? Very simply, I'll just put it to you like this. Um, Jeff Bezos, as nice a guy as he is, doesn't care about the history of Kansas City. And Sergey and Larry, from Google could care less about the poetry of Lee Wood or Lee Summit or Lenexa or... My feeling is that a public library is a place that builds collaboration and community, that preserves and protects the things that make us uniquely us. Carol, over in Kansas City, Kansas, uh, who are the people coming into your library? Are they majority today people picking up a book or are they people coming to that library for something else? they want to be on your computers or they want to be coming to an event? First of all, libraries serve the public person that uh, coming to a uh, story time at the libraries or an elderly person that uh, received an iPad for Christmas and doesn't know what to do with it. The CEO of a company that uh, wants us to do a research or it, it's the student that uh, needs uh, research for a paper. It's the immigrant coming to the com community that needs to learn English in order to be able to apply for a job. As we all know, you have to go online to apply. The majority of our uh, community do not have internet, Wi-Fi. So where do they come to? They come to the library. Uh, and, and we at the library help them uh, create an email account, help them job searching, you name it. When I say public, I mean everybody. We don't have a specific clientele. We serve everybody. Now, it wasn't that long ago Johnson County Public Libraries was making headlines for butchering pigs in the library. Now, how does that fit in with the mission of library, Sean? Well, I think it's exactly the same. It's about curiosity. Um, the biggest thing that came about was about a hundred and I think about 150 or 190 people made a collective ooh when um, the butcher showed um, where bacon comes from. It was <laughs> bacon, right? But we, to clarify, we didn't slaughter the pig. The pig was already dead, and 
And we just butchered it, but it was also kind of like, where do things come from, right? Here's a pig, and how do you break a pig down? And, and we got an audience, again, that was non-traditional and that was fascinated about that process. And I think that comes under the curiosity. If you're curious, the place to go is a library. If people are curious, they can go to their smartphones, Crosby, and get a lot of information. As I said, they can get a book downloaded from their bed. They don't even have to leave their bed and get everything sure. they need. And, and, and which, is, which is a great thing. Of course, there are a lot of people who don't have smartphones or don't know how to use them to, to get certain kinds of information. I think the key word here is information, and what libraries are about is turning information into knowledge. The library helps organize information for you, so you can find something out uh, about your world. There's kind of a myth uh, that, that Sergey Brin in, uh, in uh, The World is Flat, Tom Friedman's book, uh, ta talked about putting libraries out of business. He said he learned everything he learned in the library, but now his goal to, uh, to put us out of business. Um, Google Fiber showed up in Kansas City, and, and who were the first people they talked to? Libraries. And, and what's happened to libraries since Google Fiber showed up in, in Kansas City? Well, we've increased the number of people who come to the library. We've increased the number of people who come to us physically. We've increased the number of people who come to us virtually. Uh, the four of us represent over 10 million visitors, uh, over 10 million circulations of, guess what? Books. Um, so we're, we're hardly irrelevant. Rarely do we spend the time to bring together four top library directors to engage on issues. And I want to prod and poke you on challenges and opportunities and the future of libraries. But what is the one thing that keeps you uh, up at night, Steve Potter? But there must be something that keeps you up at night about running a library system. What is that? You know, every night I, I, I lay down and I go to bed and I wake up about five times. You know, you must be asking yourself, what could there be that's so interesting and exciting that would wake up a librarian five times during the course <laughs> of the night? What, what is there? I can't sleep at night because I'm so excited about what the future will hold. This is a well-kept secret in the library profession. We don't like to let this out, that our profession is actually very exciting and very dynamic. And, and everyone, <laughs> if they really knew everything that we know about librarianship, you all would want to... Um, uh, you know, uh, apply. I guess the thing that makes me most upset now is that I know when I wake up in the morning, I'm going to have to go through a thousand new job applications. <laughs> Clearly, it's not too late for a career change, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Steve, thank you very much. Sean Cassidy, there must be something that keeps you uh, awake at night. By the way, I belong to three library systems, and I have, I, every week I get a an email from the Johnson County Library System telling me I still have an overpaid fine <laughs> from... <laughs> December 1st, 2012, the chimpanzees I love, which my daughter actually got out from Jane Goodall, with a 60 cents fine. Okay. Can I actually pay that right now? Will that count? Could, could I do that? OK. Uh, it's there. All righty. Is, is overdue fines the thing that gets you waking no. up in a cold sweat at no. 2 in the morning, Sean? No. <laughs> I want to go back and revisit um, a point that you made earlier, a kind of questioning this kind of phone. and so. We've had this invention called the television, right? And TV. And what's wrong with that? It's great. And so, so the deal is, why would you ever go to a baseball game? You can watch it on your television. You don't have to travel. You can get instant replay. You can get a commentator giving you that. Yet, for some reason, we, we go, we sit on a hot plastic chair, right? We pay... Uh, I don't want to say an exorbitant amount for some form of beverage and some form of uh, processed meat in a nice kind of uh, <laughs> bun. And, and we love it, right? And that's what keeps me up at night. Baseball adds value. It's an intangible. It's something that we love. And what keeps me up is that question and that seeking to go, what in the library can we increase value? Can we turn that knob and make your life better richer, more fulfilling. And that may be through books, but it may be through other kind of experiences. I thought libraries were suffering from funding issues. We thought there were all these issues they were facing. Crosby, come on. Yeah, Aunt, don't I, you have these I, I was going to say, at two there, the there are two things that keep me up at night. The first thing is I wonder what Steve Potter's doing up five times in the middle <laughs> yeah. of the night. And, <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 the second, and, and the second thing that keeps me up is funding. We're spending a lot of time in Kansas City. Kansas City is really the center of it in the United States of subsidizing corporations. We're subsidizing them through tax increment financing, tax abatement, 
star bonds and peak programs and, uh, and all that that you read about. And, uh, and it's draining a huge amount of money from social services, but particularly from libraries uh, and from schools, which are primarily property tax funded and it's primary, primarily property tax money that's going to uh, these developers and, and corporations. Uh, the city is taking money from us uh, and giving it to developers. And, and, and there's something about that that's, that's really wrong. Now you hear about, and you see the headlines about TIF, tax increment financing, it's all very complicated. And you think about, well, they're bringing jobs in. What does it actually mean? I mean, are we talking it's, about it's actually hundreds of thousands of, of dollars taken It's not a subsidy of jobs. It's not a subsidy of jobs, it's a subsidy of real estate. They say it's about jobs, but it almost never is about jobs. It's almost always about real estate. They're taking, according to the, according to the city's own calculations, the county's own calculations, it takes $3 million a year from us. It takes, as a library system? As a library system. It takes $30 million a year from the Kansas City School District. It takes more money from Steve. It's taking money from all, not all of the 14 school districts that he's got, but mo many of them. Okay, Carol, are you also worried about why Steve Potter is getting up five times a night? <laughs> or is it another concern that you have at two in the morning? Yes, I wear two hats. I oversee 43 school libraries including five public libraries, so I have to juggle between public and, and, and school. Uh, on, the, on the school side, we've been fighting the budget uh, in Topeka. So my concern is when school opens, will I be able to have all my librarians come back to school? Because usually that's the first to go when there's a, a budget crisis. On the public side, that keeps me awake at night is can we innovate fast enough to keep our place in the content delivery world? That's basically what I worry about. When we think about you know, electronic books like e-books and audio books, does it cost you more money to have an e or an audio book or is it actually a saving to you that you don't actually have a physical book on the shelf? So I've got some t statistics if you, okay. if you want. Yes. So if you take Condoleezza's uh, uh, book, Democracy, the hardcover uh, uh, costs us $35. Okay. Uh, or your hardcover in, in a bookstore costs $35. The ebook costs us $105. It costs you more? Three yeah, times as much almost? $105. Wow. Now, it depends on who you're buying the ebook from. There, there are different models. You can, you can have multiple uh, checkouts on, 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 on that book. So a lot of people can read it. It's a little more expensive, is our, our estimation, uh, to do electronic books at this point. There's another publisher, one of the big five publishers, that uh, requires us to buy a new license for an ebook after every 26 circulations. So you can have a book on the shelf and it can check out and check out and check out, and it gets an incredible bang for its buck but you don't get that in the electronic uh, resource area. It, it is all changing, the licensing and everything is changing, um, but the truth of the matter is our public wants us to be able to provide content in print and virtual formats, and so we have to do both. I think we all have this e-card. You never have to come into a library to get a library card, right? And you never have to come into a library to get library services. Does that matter to you as the head of a library system that somebody is only an online um, subscriber, a member of the library system? Does it matter that they never come into a physical space? Or are you happy because they're never dirtying your carpets or using the restrooms? I don't think I'm either happy or, or sad. And for, for me, it's not about the container of the book that is sacred. There's nothing sacred about uh, paper, what's really sacred is the ideas and the words and how they are conveyed into your mind and then how you process them. So I take no personal offense if you never come in to our library, but if you are a, a, a digital user, then you're just a different, you've, you've entered the library, you've just entered it in a different way. More from our library directors in just a moment, and I'd love to hear from you, your questions to our library directors too. But let's go back to our Libraries Out Loud series on KCPT. In the last 15 years, I've seen a huge shift in the work we do because things have changed a lot with the internet and all that. Throughout most of my adult life, libraries have been quiet places. We did our best to shh, shh, shh to everyone around. You know, librarians have gotten this stereotype of being shh and quiet, and actually the public library is kind of a noisy place. We actually just moved to Kansas from Canada, so it was quite a big move. We didn't know anybody. 
So this was one of the first places that we came to actually just start to meet people. And if we can't get to our libraries, they'll come to us. These are my wonderful books from the library by mail. Sewing machine secrets, great. That's what I was waiting for. Oh, this one has a book that I ordered. As you can tell, I've been blessed to be advanced in age. And so going to the library is not as feasible. But because they have the senior outreach service, I get to have that world brought to me. And that is wonderful. I tell people that I'm kind of like Santa Claus. You know, I get to uh, put these packages together and, and uh, send them in the mail, and our customers really look forward to receiving mail from us. I have a problem with depression, so this is a godsend. It gives, it's a lifeline for me. Most often, persons, when they start becoming of an age, you have friends and relatives. I, I wouldn't say that they don't care, but they don't have the time. Books are one of the great loves of my life. So sharing that interest with someone like Michael or Michelle, who also is at the library by mail, and that kind of networking is extremely important to anyone who suffers from depression. I'm a very interesting kind of librarian. I go out and I look for small businesses to help. Large corporations do not create as many jobs as small businesses. People like Brandon, they are who are taking care of our communities now. What the library has done, it's nailed me down into figuring out how to operate. The marketing aspect of it, it's put me in places and in front of the, the people that I've needed to be in front of. A lot of people may not realize that they need to do research before they even start a business, and we are there to help them do that, which is free 24-7. And I'm the Kansas City Public Library's Digital Inclusion Fellow. We are going to be facilitating our first learning circle at an off-site community partner. Since we go on the internet and we find a few Because I need to learn how to work my computer, I bought one. My seven-year-old grandson know how to work it, and I'm 54, and I don't know how to work, so this class is gonna really teach me a lot. We're not just providing access to technology, we're also providing point of need tech assistance, which I think is great, because I don't know anywhere in the community where you can get that. Make the use of the internet service here, because it's two times faster here than it is at home. It's all a high-tech world, so you have to be ahead of the group, then behind. It's all a high-tech world. Okay, let me bring Michael Price up real quickly. Do you mind our filmmaker who produced the entire series spent months and months <laughs> working with all the library districts. We always have expectations as journalists in what we think we're going to see. What was the biggest surprise, the biggest thing you learned, Michael, along this long journey as you lifted up the hood on the libraries? I think the, um, the thing that uh, struck me the most in the, in the process of making this is just how much affection there is out there for the libraries. Um, people's local libraries are very much part of the family, part of their life. It's their home from home. The libraries are very unique because it's a shared public space. And we don't have too many of those. I mean, think of you know, what else we've got out there, parks as well, perhaps. Um, but a library has got a, a very unique role to play. And they hold, as I say, in great esteem and great affection by, by the community right across the area. Thank you very much indeed. And I think you've seen from these films the expansive role that even I'm surprised at that libraries are doing, whether it be kickboxing and yoga and, yes, butchering pigs and you name it, that libraries are performing today. But nobody knew uh, we needed an iPhone until Steve Jobs said, this is what people need. What needs could libraries meet that users haven't yet even thought of? Crosby Kemper? Well, I, I think the, the, the thing that is beginning to go on in libraries, and it's an extension of things that have gone on certainly for the last 20 years, um, is healthcare. Uh, I think uh, w uh, the telemedicine is becoming a major thing, and it's going to be another digital divide.
as companies like Cerner figure out how to, how to, how to develop electronic health records that can go from your wrist or from uh, something like an Alexa or whatever it is in your home. There are going to be a lot of people without that. And where are they going to get, where are they going to get the help that they need? Where, where, where are your vital statistics going to be uh, downloaded, uploaded to your, uh, to your hospital or your clinic? Probably in the library. I think you'll, you'll find libraries as center of, uh, of health care in America. Ladies and gentlemen, would you trust Crosby Kemper to give you a colonoscopy? <laughs> no, it's a, we're in a place of curiosity. I'm just curious <laughs> as to the answer to the question. You may be very comfortable with that. He's a brilliant man. So, You've the really answer... gone to the bottom this time. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Thank you. All right. I deserve that one. Crosby, I keep coming to these things because you always present things that make me want to think. Now you've scared me. <laughs> what are the librarians going to do to protect me? The Patriot Act, the information, the data I take out, and now you're going to have my medical records? No, I don't think we, 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 don't, we don't want to keep your medical records. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and I think you mentioned the Patriot Act, yes. and, and uh, uh, information itself wouldn't reside in the library. It would, it, it's simply the connection to your doc. We'd be the, the place where you're connected to your doctor, the place where you're connected to the clinic, to the, to the database of information. Thank you very much. So what about a totally bookless library? In San Antonio, they did it, located in San Antonio's underserved south side, Bexar County Digital Library, stocked with 10,000 e-books, 500 e-readers, 48 computers, 20 iPads and laptops. It's got a children's area, study rooms, and a Starbucks-esque cafe. No printed pages to be found. Is there room for at least one of these library branches in Mid-Continent, KCK, Kansas City, Missouri? How about Johnson County, which I see you're building new libraries. Come on, what, could one of them be a completely bookless one, Sean? No, um, no. Why not? <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> Why not? Uh, well, the assumption is that we're at the information age. We're really at the noise age. And what libraries have to do is differentiate or filter out the information from that noise. If everything is transactional in dialogue, then what we'll have is a society that just tweets to each other. And if we've seen that in the political process, that's not working so well for <laughs> democracy. <laughs> Steve Potter, you are Mr. Forward Thinking, progressive. You, you love digital gadgetry. Is there room in the mid-continent public library system for a totally bookless branch? The content is always going to drive the container. If the content's no good, it doesn't matter what the container is. My argument is that there will be libraries with books because some content is most appropriate in book format. I have to interrupt you there, Steve, because we have a tweet coming in from this gentleman. <laughs> Sir, thank you very much. In 140 characters or less, we are thrilled that you're here. Come on in, sir. Since I retired, I've been to seven different libraries. The biggest thing is that you used to be able to go to the newspaper and get the articles. Now it's all on microfiche. So that's why I have to go to so many different libraries now, because they're individual libraries get that area's paper. You're actually trying to solve that right now, aren't you, Steve? One of the promises that we made to people when they decided to uh, endorse our Proposition L uh, last November was that if they did this, we would buy the digital Kansas City Star. So going all the way back to, uh, to 1880, uh, all the way to present, we will have the Kansas City Star that's available uh, online, uh, free text searchable, um, and, and you, can, you can look it up in your home, on your smartphone, on your iPad, all you need is a library card. Here's the big secret. Does anybody else know who owns that in greater Kansas City? Not even the Kansas City Star owns that content. But and it costs, we, Steve is paying a huge amount of money for it too. We are grateful to him to, well, for doing but, that. But it's part of what is, uh, a public library needs to do, is to archive that and make that available. So this fall, there'll be one place for you to go to find all the articles of the Kansas City Star from beginning to end. 
which you couldn't even get from the Kansas City Star itself. Which you can't even get from the Kansas City Star itself. Madam, your question, please. I'm just um, in awe of the four of you. I I happen to serve as a school librarian, and I just wanted to thank you for mentioning school libraries and for the folks in the audience to keep in mind that we definitely need help. We need funding. We have one large library system on the Johnson County side that is phasing out their library program, and it's very sad. So... uh, Please give some thought to that. Uh, We have terrific public libraries. We want to have strong school libraries as well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Getting commendations there. Piggybacking on that, we had an email from somebody who couldn't be here. Stephen Grandview wants to know, how much of a librarian's current job could be done by someone in a different location? For example, someone in India who answers questions via telephone or synchronous chat or by computer software at an electronic kiosk. Now, we know libraries are suffering, you know, all of you are suffering from financial issues. It's a struggle. Uh, What what about that, Sean? Human uh, dialogue isn't uh, transactional. Um, But you have electronic checkouts at the library. We we do. We've already gone that far. Because because that's a transaction that makes sense. But if you, again, the conversation isn't transactional, and I am am absolutely against it, because the person on the other end will go, well, thank you, you know, Mr. Castley. Is there anything else that I can ask you? And you know darn well that they don't want you to ask another question. (laughs) What they want to do is hang up. And, and pick up again so their counters can be, you know, you know it can be charged for it. And so I want, I want a, a, an interaction where someone asks a question and that causes them to think critically and then ask a better question. Okay, I have a better question for you and we probably end with this one. Jan in Overland Park asks, in Australia you can now pick up and drop off your books using a drone. Do you see that in your future? Clearly not Sean, but how about Steve Potter? Come on, in mid-continent public library system. Well, uh, if it makes sense, if the time is right, if it's the you know if it's cost-effective, I'm not sure why we wouldn't. If we can get more books to more people, I'm I'm entirely uh, in favor of it. I think you know with the kind of circulation that we've we've got all together, uh, and we started uh, delivering books by drones, the, the the skies would be full of drones. So it might be it might be a little bit of a traffic problem. Carol. I'm a little bit doubtful. People want to, uh, instantaneous use. They don't want to wait for a drone to come and deliver something. Sean, you're actually building a brand new library, the Monticello Library in Shawnee. Fewer people living in Shawnee. You've got a little bit more airspace there. Can you see that in your future? We use technology where technology makes sense. Technology is a tool. It's not an answer. A Silicon Valley really c- comes and says that... Uh, you know, technology is the answer. And I I just don't agree with that. It's something that we use in very specific ways. And when we're saying maybe no to drones, we're really saying yes to something else. And and I think one, all of these libraries, what I admire about all of these directors is all of them think strategically, which is we have limited dollars and limited things that we can do with those dollars. And that each of them is kind of laser focused on how to maximize that dollar for the community that they serve. Ladies and gentlemen, you've been listening to Steve Potter, the head of the Mid-Continent Public Library System, Carol Levers, head of the Kansas City, Kansas Library System, Crosby Kemper, the head of the Kansas City, Missouri Public Library System, and Sean Cassily, who leads libraries in Johnson County in Kansas. You've been listening to yourselves with great questions. Our filmmaker, Michael Price, we thank you for being part of this experience with us at KCPT. Have a great night and a safe trip home.